Hi guys, Dr. Daniel Chanishev from Green Square Health here. Um, this video is just to outline the pros and cons or the risk benefit analysis of the AstraZeneca vaccine as it stands uh, June 29, 2021. Um, this is following the announcement yesterday from Prime Minister Scott Morrison that people under 40 can receive the AstraZeneca vaccine if they've been consented to the risks and understand the pros and cons of it. So here we go. In April, May this year, ATAGI, or the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunizations, announced that the preferred vaccine for people under the age of 60 was the Pfizer vaccine. This was a, a sort of advice to be taken by the medical community, um, particularly taking into consideration the amount of circulating COVID we had in Australia at the time. So the risk of contracting COVID and having the consequences of it versus receiving the vaccine. Now, in the last few weeks, this has changed for a variety of reasons. One, we have COVID spreading in the community around Australia. Uh, and number two, the variant of concern, the Delta variant, seems to be much different in the way that it spreads. So I think it's shifted our risk of contracting COVID from a low risk uh, sort of community to a much higher risk community at the moment through no fault of anyone. Just, you know, the way the virus spreads is faster. I think we finally accepted that it is an airborne spread and it takes mere seconds versus, you know, the old 15 minutes, 1.5 meters that we we're hoping the virus would continue to respect. So the main focus will be the risk of clotting or more accurately uh, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome following the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, particularly in the age group 18 to 49, which is the, the one that most data has been collected on, especially in the UK. So at the moment for people aged under 50, the risk in Australia, the estimated risk after the first dose of receiving the AstraZeneca vaccine of developing TTS is 3.1 per 100,000 doses or 31 per million is probably the easiest way to think about that. And of the 60 cases of TTS that were reported until about the 16th of June, um, there were two fatalities in Australia, which were very unfortunate. Um, but that puts the fatality rate at about two to 3% um, for a condition that's already at low, low risk. But getting the syndrome isn't just about dying or not. Getting the syndrome means there's a clot somewhere in the body and some clots are worse than others. So they do divide it into two tiers, which is the dangerous tier is clots that are in the venous sinus uh, of the brain, which can cause venous sinus thrombosis, um, or in what they call the splanchnic cir circulation, which is the circulation that goes to your intestines and, and internal organs, essentially. Those two are more dangerous than more peripheral uh, clots, say in the lungs and the legs, which are dangerous on their own, but much more manageable. Um, but because we understand this process a little bit better, um, the fatality rate seems to be quite low in Australia. So I did say that in Australia, the risk of developing TTS after the first dose is 3.1 per 100,000. Um, at the same time, the UK came out with their data in the same age group, 18 to 49, and their risk in that age group was 1.9 per 100,000 or 19.6 per um, million. And that was after giving 8.6 million doses. So many more doses than we had given over a much longer time period. Um, I'm sure there's differences in the way things are reported and recorded, but I, you know, we have a very comparable health system and the way we consider risk and reporting in Australia and UK is quite quite comparable. So at that time, there were some pretty great infographics and information on the risks versus benefits of um, the COVID vaccination versus getting COVID. Um, and at that time, I think the risks were quite low in Australia. Someone who was 25 who developed COVID would probably more likely have an outcome of a clot than they would have if they contracted COVID. That was because we were deemed a low risk transmission society at the time. Now, the Winton Centre for Risk uh, Communication Evaluation in Cambridge in the UK came out with some excellent information at the time. Unfortunately, it hasn't been updated to reflect the latest numbers. But back then, they did divide it into three categories, low, medium, and high risk of transmission. With the Delta variant, I think it's fair to assume that things are at a high risk of transmission. So I would use those numbers to base my pros and cons. And I'm going to include it in this video, but include a link to that resource at the bottom as well. Um, so you can see for yourself what the risk benefit analysis is. Essentially, it's using ICU admissions as our surrogate marker for serious disease from COVID. 
So if we can stop an ICU admission, it's a significant benefit. Um, it doesn't mean you're not going to get respiratory symptoms. It doesn't mean you're not going to be unwell. Um, but the point of vaccination at the moment is to turn this from a pandemic into something that is endemic. Endemic sounds bad, um, but influenza is endemic. You know, conditions that we live with and, and transmit a lot and still cause disease, but are much more manageable once we have a good proportion of our society immunized and people know how to live with this condition in a more accurate way. Treatment is improved, a diagnosis improves, tracking down big case numbers improves as well. So we want to go from pandemic to endemic um, and maybe one day something that doesn't exist anymore. Um, but at the moment, that's the, the reasoning between the pros and the cons. Now, the other thing about transmissibility, if you remember early last year, we were talking about the R0 number. If the R0 number is below one, um, the, the vaccine, the, the virus really isn't spreading much at all. I haven't seen an R0 number published this year, and I think that's because it would scare us if we saw it. But I'm certain it's over one, uh, looking at how one single case really has triggered off a lot of this. Um, I'm certain the R0 is above one. So let's go out and get vaccinated with the, vote, with the vaccine that's most appropriate for you. Um, we're happy to provide it. Check out our other video to learn more. Um, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks for listening. So at that time, there were some pretty great infographics information on the risks versus benefits of um, the COVID vaccination versus getting COVID. Um, and at that time, I think the risks were quite low in Australia. Someone who was 25 who developed COVID would probably more likely have an outcome of a clot than they would have if they contracted COVID. That was because we were deemed a low risk transmission society at the time. Now, the Winton Center for Risk uh, Communication Evaluation in Cambridge in the UK came out with some excellent information at the time. Unfortunately, it hasn't been updated to reflect the latest numbers. But back then, they did divide it into three categories, low, medium, and high risk of transmission. With the Delta variant, I think it's fair to assume that things are at a high risk of transmission. So I would use those numbers to base my pros and cons. And I'm going to include it in this video, but include a link to that resource at the bottom as well. Um, so you can see for yourself what the risk benefit analysis is. Essentially, it's using ICU admissions as our surrogate marker for serious disease from COVID. So if we can stop an ICU admission, it's a significant benefit. Um, it doesn't mean you're not going to get respiratory symptoms. It doesn't mean you're not going to be unwell. Um, but the point of vaccination at the moment is to turn this from a pandemic into something that is endemic. Endemic sounds bad. Um, but influenza is endemic, you know, conditions that we live with and, and transmit a lot and still cause disease, but are much more manageable once we have a good proportion of our society immunized and people know how to live with this condition in a more accurate way. Treatment is improved, a diagnosis improves, tracking down big case numbers improves as well. So we want to go from pandemic to endemic um, and maybe one day something that doesn't exist anymore. Um, but at the moment, that's the, the reasoning between the pros and the cons. Now, the other thing about transmissibility, if you remember early last year, we were talking about the R0 number. If the R0 number is below one, um, the, the vaccine, the, the virus really isn't spreading much at all. I haven't seen an R0 number published this year, and I think that's because it would scare us if we saw it. But I'm certain it's over one, uh, looking at how one single case really has triggered off a lot of this. Um, I'm certain the R0 is above one. So let's go out and get vaccinated with the, vote, with the vaccine that's most appropriate for you. Um, we're happy to provide it. Check out our other video to learn more. Um, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks for listening.